Okay, let me try that again. I think I was muted. Good morning. I think we are live here from Los Angeles. Uh, welcome to the California Science Center's Facebook Live broadcast with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. I am your MC today. I'm honored to have this job. My name is Ken Phillips, and I'm the curator of aerospace sciences here at the California Science Center in Los Angeles. And I'm here with a very distinguished guest, Dr. Michael Ressler from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And today we're gonna to be talking about one of the most exciting missions that we could talk about. And that's the James Webb Space Telescope launch and that's coming right up. So I'd like to introduce Mike. Mike, take it away and Hi, um, Good morning, Ken. Uh, my name is Mike Ressler. I'm the US project scientist for the mid-infrared instrument on the James Webb Space Telescope. And we'll get more into all, what all that means in a little bit, but it's a pleasure to be here. Great. So um, before we dive into this, and I promise everybody we're going to have a great discussion about this James Webb telescope. It is a fabulous, fabulous machine. We're going to learn all about its instruments. Mike is principal investigator in one of those. But before I do that, I'd like you to meet a little bit, learn, learn a little bit more about Mike and just meet this guy. First of all, um, share with us, Mike, how you got into your interest in, in, in science, partic particularly uh, uh, deep space exploration and the kind of things that you do. How did you get into it? And the second part of the question, not only how did you get into it, what got you interested in it, but how did you wind up getting this fantastic job that you've got as a principal investigator on one of the most impressive missions <laughs> to ever fly? How did that happen? Okay, well, like many, like many people my age, I became interested when I saw the astronauts walking on the moon when I was a kid. Uh, I was in second grade when our teacher brought a television into the classroom and we got to watch the astronauts driving the moon buggy around uh, a bit during Apollo 16, um, you know, which is obviously very fascinating. Um, I've always been interested in science. So by third grade, I was telling my friends I was gonna be a scientist when I grew up. And in sixth grade, I had the chance to see the planet Saturn through a small telescope. And I can still remember that field of view. Um, and so, you know, I was just fascinated with astronomy the whole time. Uh, how I got here today, um, I went off to college and got my bachelor's degree in physics, and then later on my PhD in astronomy. Um, all along the way, even as an undergraduate, I started working on astronomical instruments. So I was interested not just in the science itself, but also in the tools that we use to do the science. And so um, I continued that on in grad school, uh, worked on a number of instruments for some ground-based telescopes. And then when I finished my PhD, I came to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, first as a postdoctoral researcher, and then as a staff scientist. And I've been working on instruments the whole time. Um, yeah. In 1997, the opportunity to work on a concept study for a mid-infrared instrument for the what was then called the Next Generation Space Telescope, now the James Webb Telescope, came along and uh, we started working on that concept study. And then in 2001, we were actually um, awarded part of the mid-infrared instrument here at JPL. That's fantastic. So you've been with this since its conception, actually. You were one of the people who was kind of formulating the idea for this long before it actually was, was, was machined and fabricated and, and assembled. Yeah, there, there are a few people who've been working on it a little bit longer than I have, but not very many. This is amazing. And so it sounds like your job is at the interface between science and engineering. I mean, you're the person who takes what the scientists are interested in understanding about the world and the way it works and developing the machinery that gets them to that point. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Is that correct? Yeah, so my most important job is something as a translator. So, you know, the scientists will say, we want to observe this kind of star, or we want to observe a galaxy that's this far away. And I figure out how to translate that into terms that the engineers understand, where I'll say, we need a camera that is sensitive to these wavelengths, that has this sensitivity. And then the engineers, they don't let me touch hardware. So the engineers go off and build it. And then um, when the instrument is built, we characterize it, we understand how well the instrument works. And then I go back to the scientists and say, here's the instrument, this is what it's able to do. Um, now let's go off and do it. 
But suppose it requires too much power, or it's too massive, or it's too too too, too big a volume. Then what do you have to do? Um, hopefully, we find things like that very early on in yeah. the design, <laughs> right. and uh, we get things straightened out. And uh, you know, it's been a long road, but here we are. So you've got a series of specifications that you're you're cognizant of uh, along the way. That's yes, fine. exactly. Well, Let's dive into this, this amazing machine, the James Webb Space Telescope. We've all been, been sort of waiting with bated breath for this thing, and at least those of us that are interested in astronomy and cosmology and, and that sort of thing. And um, it's going to be an amazing thing. And why don't we start out with a question, basically, um, what, could Jay, what, what could the James Webb Telescope tell us that we, that, that we didn't know before? I mean, why this telescope? Why now? OK, so let, let me show you a picture. OK. <clears throat> see if I can make this work. Okay, so this is a, a very famous image from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's one of the so-called deep fields where we looked at a spot of sky where we didn't see anything before. Uh, the telescopes that we had on the ground just weren't sensitive enough to look at some of these so-called blank spots. Mm -hmm. And when we looked at it with Hubble, you know, we see there are thousands of galaxies in this particular picture. Um, and in fact, everything except maybe that bright red star that shows the spikes, everything else in this picture is a galaxy. So that was that was what Hubble could do. Mm -hmm. And at the very limits of what Hubble can do, and with support with some other space telescopes, we actually found that within this image, if I can make it work, there's a fuzzy little blob uh, with a very unlovely name, um, GNZ11. But this is a very, very distant galaxy um, that formed when the universe was only a few hundred million years old. Um, mm -hmm. And so these are some of the surprises that we'd like to find out more about because, um, you know, one of the questions we'd like to know is how did galaxies form? Um, in fact, one of the one of the main questions that uh, the Webb telescope was designed to answer was what were the first light emitting objects of the universe? And then as a follow up, how did the first galaxies form? So this is one of those very, very early galaxies. And it took a lot of work to find just this one. Uh, but Hubble opened the field. It allowed us to answer the questions. And now we want to answer some of those questions uh, with the Webb telescope. Okay, now I got two questions if I can quickly. First of all, is that image that you're showing me, the entire image of the galaxies, is that the entire night sky? Is that just a small section of the sky or? No, that's actually a very small part of the night sky. So imagine looking through a soda straw at the sky. That's that's about what this is this is like. So it's just a very small patch in between other stars that, that we can see. Um, so, you know, it's just a few fractions of a degree in width. And what is specifically surprising about that GNZ11? I mean, what is it about that that was that that was an anomaly or that was surprising to to astronomers as they looked at that that galaxy? It doesn't look like a galaxy to me, quite frankly. But. Yeah, it, it looks kind of like a blob, um, but it's actually a relatively mature galaxy, and that's what was so surprising. We didn't expect to find something that's a relatively big galaxy this early on. We, we expected to find sort of patchy clusters of stars, but not something that was big enough that would emit this much energy uh, this early on. So that, that was a surprise. Are there any other examples that you might uh, think of about yeah, so the, the next picture um, is another one of those surprises. So the previous image, there, were, there was one very young galaxy. Well, there are many young galaxies, but there was one that's extremely young in there. This particular image is another deep field, and this kind of green and blue colors were taken by a, great, a big ground-based telescope. Mm -hmm. But the red dots uh, were taken by the Spitzer Space Telescope. This was an infrared space telescope um, that had a, a a light collecting mirror that was about 36 inches in diameter. And um, when we looked in the infrared at you know different wavelengths, the same wavelengths that the Webb telescope is going to work, in fact. But when we looked at it with, with Spitzer, we found all these what look like red spots in this image. But these are all galaxies. And these are also all very young. And there are many, many more than we expected to find. Um, 
so you know as we as we have new tools that that look we see things that we never expected to see um so this was a surprise our, our current theories of how galaxies form how when they would have formed in the early universe this yeah. picture doesn't fit and so we have to go back and study it in different ways you know ask new questions how did all those galaxies get there so early so yeah the bottom line i guess is Jim, why are they there you know from what you know from what sources yeah yeah so, so, I was go ahead. Say, what, what might be a follow-on to figure out the answer to that question because all these galaxies that are there and they shouldn't be there by virtue of what we can currently think um and yet here's the evidence to suggesting that boy they are there a lot earlier and in a lot greater number than one would right. expect um, yeah, so with uh, with the Spitzer Space Telescope, we were able to get these images. Uh, what we'll be able to do with Webb is to get spectra of of many of these individual galaxies, okay. and that will that will tell us a lot more about what's there, how they assembled, um, and even specifically how old they are. Um, so you know, we have we have good guesses from Spitzer, um, but with Webb, we'll be able to really pin down some of these questions. And then the theorists will go off and try to make new theories that fit all the evidence, and hopefully we'll have a better understanding of how they how they actually form so early. Amazing piece of the puzzle, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. It's stunning that we here in this place, arguably, we stuck here on Earth or in the worst possible place to ask questions about the universe. I mean, because we can't get off the planet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and everything that we do is by inference and nature is speaking to us through laws and it's all about, I suppose, translating what this light, light, light is actually saying. Um, what about nebulae? Is there anything that um, kind of surprising things that, that, uh, that you've well, learned? That or? Even, even close to home, we always have new surprises whenever we look, whenever we look at the universe with new instruments or new capabilities. We always find something new. So let me introduce you to another um, object with a not very nice name. This is this is called NGC fifteen fourteen. Um, it's a little planetary nebula that's you know a few hundred light years away. Um, a planetary nebula is what we see when a star is in the process of dying. Uh, when stars die, they shed off their outer layers. They just kind of blow them away. And so we can get these really pretty structures. Uh, this one looks kind of round at visible wavelengths. Uh, yeah. Others look more like butterflies and you know, some other very spectacular pictures. But uh, William, Her William Herschel actually discovered this, this nebula in 1790. Um, so we've known about it for you know, more than 200 years. And people have been observing it with big telescopes and small telescopes. And this is the way we, it looked to us until we looked at it with another infrared telescope that uh, was launched at the end of 2009 called the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. And when we looked at it in the infrared wavelengths, all of a sudden these orange color rings popped out. So even though we knew about this planetary nebula for 230 years when we had a new set of eyes we discovered something that we didn't expect we didn't know that it was there it was just by virtue of the fact that we had a new tool mm -hmm. and so with web um you know it, it will be like this on steroids because it's so big and so sensitive you know the most exciting thing about web is not studying the things that we already know about it's finding and studying things that we have no idea are even out there and that's what makes it so powerful that's amazing it's it's funny that that thing existed for so long and it, just just by virtue of switching to a different part of the spectrum there's this tremendous amount of new information that information tells you what that's a thermal profile that we now know is associated with that object that we didn't know was there before yeah so, so the rings appear to be very cool um, yeah. but you know, we'd like to learn more and I'm going to observe it with Webb and we will find out more. <laughs> totally. That is amazing. And you'll observe it, I guess, in a rather um, improved uh, uh, level of, of, of focus, right? It'll be a lot more uh, highly resolved. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get much sharper images. Um, WISE, uh, this particular observatory, was only about 20 inches in diameter. Um, and so, um, you know, 
with web where where we're, we're 20 feet in diameter, you know, six meters in diameter, it's, it will be a much, much sharper picture. Yeah. So let's talk about <clears throat> kind of the operation of a telescope a little bit. The thing that amazes me is that um, this kind of separates us meaningfully from our ancients, from the ancient observers. The fact is that they had some pretty amazing discoveries, um, really, really smart, clever <clears throat> analyses that they did coming up with the motion of the planets. Um, you know, I'm thinking of uh, people like Kepler and um, Tycho Brahe who assembled the data, not with telescopes, by the way, but just by measuring angles and that sort of stuff. And then you had Isaac Newton and people who were putting together um, formulas and equations to explain with amazing uh, accuracy just how all this stuff worked. But here's the thing, they could only do that with things they could see with the unaided eye. And once the telescope became really applied to astronomical uses, and I guess we credit Galileo for that, even though he didn't invent the telescope, he turned it on um, Jupiter and other objects. He began to your point to see not only things that were not seen before, because that's what telescopes are good. They not only show you things in more detail that you can already see, but they show you stuff that you didn't know was there. Um, skip ahead several hundred years, and now we realize that that light is telling us something. It's speaking to us in a code. And that's right. another thing that the ancients couldn't figure it out. So let's talk about a little bit, if we can, about why this, what, what, what is this message that's being carried to us and how do we know what the stars are trying to say? They're speaking to us in light. How, how do, what's that all about? So one of the most important tools that we have in astronomy is, is a way of looking at light called spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll try to demonstrate what I mean. So this is, this is a picture of a glowing tube of hydrogen gas. Um, it's, it's just a glass tube with hydrogen in it. We pass an electric current through it and it starts to glow. And it has this kind of reddish pinkish color to it. If we actually break the colors into a, what would be a rainbow with, with white light, if you look at it through a prism, you see, you see a rainbow, you know, full color rainbow. If I looked at this hydrogen tube in a prism, instead of a rainbow, I'd see a series of very bright lines, very bright emission, you know, very specific colors. Um, and the interesting thing about this is these colors are very precise. Hydrogen emits light at these specific colors, like, you know, it's like, it's like a thumbprint. And mm -hmm. so if, if I look at a star and I break its light into colors, if I see lines at 656 nanometers, um, I know that that's one of the lines from hydrogen. And so by looking at stars with the same technique, I can say, ah, hydrogen. Now, the interesting thing is that if the gas is hot and glowing, it emits light at those very discrete colors. If I have a white light source, say a star, and it's shining through a cloud of hydrogen, that cloud of hydrogen absorbs exactly those same wavelengths of light, exactly those same colors. So whether the gas is hot and glowing by itself or whether it's cold and absorbing background light, it's still got that thumbprint so that you know, everywhere I look, I can see the thumbprint and say, ah, oh, there's hydrogen there. And every chemical element has its own thumbprint. So if I looked for helium or neon or whatever, um, it each of them has their own set of fingerprints. And so I can use spectroscopy to break <laughs> the light into colors and get some idea of what the composition of the object I'm looking at actually is. Okay, so if I look at the light it is coming directly from a star. If I'm looking exactly at the light from the star and I take a, basically a prism to your point and I split that spectrum apart, <clears throat> assuming I can see everything there, then because I'm looking directly at the star, I'll get those bright lines that look like um, where you say, where you, where you have the arrow, the first of the arrows there that goes to the right, the top arrow. Right. But now in order to look through the cold gas, would that be an example? For example, suppose I'm looking at the atmosphere of a planet and I've got starlight from behind the planet that may be shining. Is that an example of um, light from a star um, transiting the atmosphere of an object like a planet um, and then having those equivalent 
lines taken out of that um, that spectrum. That's why they drop out. Is that correct? Yes, exactly right. And so another one of the main science themes that um, the Webb telescope will be addressing is the atmospheres around planets, around other stars. It sounds it sounds so fantastic. 20 years ago, we couldn't do this. Uh, and it's really hard to do now. But Webb, Webb will let us uh, do a lot of new science along those lines. But that's exactly right. As a, as a planet crosses in front of the star, we'll be able to um, see, you know, we'll be able to get spectra of the star plus the planet and be able to see uh, components in that planet's atmosphere. Um, you know, it'll be tricky. <laughs> it will be very, very hard, but, you know, it's something that a lot of people are looking forward to doing. And we can only do experiments or studies like that because we're able to break the light into these rainbows uh, to let us see what things are composed of. Yeah, beautiful imagery. Yeah. yeah. And then every element in the periodic table has such yeah. its, own, its own unique footprint, right? Yeah, every, everything has its own unique signature. Okay. Um, now the stuff out there is not all static, it's moving around. So right. that, that in principle, that would affect this stuff in some way, some meaningful ways. Yeah. Yeah, so um, there is an effect called the Doppler shift. Uh, it's very familiar if you're standing outside and an ambulance passes by you as the ambulance is passing, as it's coming towards you, um, the pitch of the siren shifts to higher frequencies. And when it's going away from you, it shifts down to lower frequencies. That's called the Doppler effect. And light does exactly the same thing. So if an object is coming toward us, the light is shifted to a higher frequency, which makes it look bluer than it would have before. And if it's going away from us, it looks redder than it would have um, before. So um, we can use that same principle uh, to figure out how fast an object is moving. And so we can start with those fingerprints. So, you know, the, the line labeled lab reference in this picture is, you know, what a mixture of gases might look like when we study it in the laboratory where it's not moving at all. Mm -hmm. but then as we look at nearby stars and then galaxies, that thumbprint actually shifts to the right, to the red as the object is farther away. And when you're looking at distant galaxies, because the universe is expanding, um, it looks like they're moving away from us very, very quickly. And so the lines move farther and farther to the red, to the right, until so we have very distant galaxies where some of the lines actually we can't see anymore at visible wavelengths because they're shifted so far into the red. You know, for example, if you look at the laboratory reference, you see two uh, lines that are in the sort of yellow and orange color at what's labeled 600 nanometers. Right. So, you know, as, as you go up the chart, you see those moving closer and closer to the edge until the second line where it's labeled distant galaxy. What was an orange line is now a deep red line. Okay. If we go to a very distant galaxy, those two lines have moved completely off. And so we can't see them at visible wavelengths. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the infrared, if we look at infrared wavelengths, those two lines are still there. It's just we need a new tool and different set of instruments in order to be able to see them. So when we talked about looking at galaxies at the very beginning of the universe and trying to understand how they were assembled, mm -hmm. we have to look at infrared wavelengths to mm -hmm. see the hydrogen and helium and so forth because it's been redshifted into that part of the spectrum. And so that's why we sometimes call JWST, James Webb's Space Telescope, you know, a time machine mm -hmm. because it allows us to look farther back in time than ever before <clears throat> because we are able to measure what would have been visible wavelength lines that have been redshifted out into the infrared. Interesting. So when you say it's blue shifted or red shifted, it doesn't look blue to the eye or, or if it's coming closer to you or red to the eye, it just means that that entire spectrum is shifted toward the longer wavelengths. That's what you actually mean, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Got it. Um, Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Very it powerful occurred, tool. It occurred to me because I've always wondered, well, if you had a single color, a monochromatic source, and you looked at it, then how would you know it was moving? I mean, it could actually be green or it could actually be red. I think it must be then that these spectral lines maintain their relative positions. And so that's the right. Spectrum shifts, right? That's what's going on, right? 
Yeah, so if we only see a single wavelength, we actually don't know what it is. Um, we actually need to see a number of spectral lines in order to be able to say, yes, that's the thumbprint. It's just moved over here. Um, and, and, you know, so that, that is the trick is seeing a number of lines that we can say, yes, the, you know, the relative spacing looks like hydrogen. So it must be hydrogen. Yeah, um, that's fascinating. So yeah. as long as I know what that original, so, so it can't fool me. In other words, if, if I see something shifted and I say, oh, wait a minute, that's the relative spacing to your point for hydrogen or helium or whatever element is, um, then that fact that it's moving is not fooling me. I know what's actually in that, in, it, it, you know, if it's an absorption spectrum, for example, I know that the lines that are dropping out are now black because they've been absorbed. That suggests that, I don't know, high oxygen is in, in the atmosphere of this exoplanet or, or hydrogen right. or helium or whatever. Okay, got it. Yep, yep, exactly. Fantastic. Wow. So, um, so you guys, so, so do you look directly at, do you look directly at colors when you're making your, 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 spec, your, your spectros, spectrographs there or what do you? Yeah, as, as pretty as rainbows are, I really love rainbows, but as pretty as they are, they're not very good for numerical analysis. So we plot the intensity of that rainbow as a function of wavelength. So up at the top, um, every time there's a bright line, when you look down at the plot, there's a, there's a peak that shows us how bright that line is. And then you can use the relative brightnesses of the lines to get more information about what, what the composition is or how hot it is, um, how dense it is. Uh, there's, there's lots of different things we can learn by looking at the strength of those absorption or emission lines. And in fact, you know, we can't see rainbows in the infrared. So if we wanna study things in the infrared, we have to do everything by plots. But if I can just jump ahead to the next picture, this is, this is a spectrum of a nearby very young star um, that's still in the process of forming. Um, so we don't have Doppler shifts. These are the wavelengths that of infrared light that are being emitted by this very young star. And what I want to point out is that unlike visible wavelengths where we see spectral lines mostly from individual atoms, individual elements uh, like hydrogen and helium, in the infrared, we start seeing molecules. And so we'll see things like water ice or alcohol or, or carbon dioxide. And so, you know, this is another way that having a, an observatory that works at infrared wavelengths gives us new tools to look um, at how things were formed, what, what elements make them up. That's fantastic. That's really interesting. Yeah. So that's a spectral line for complex molecules, not just right. things like uh, elements. That's fantastic. Not, not just simple look, atoms. Yeah, and those look like they would be absorption spectrums because they're going down, right? I mean, so these are things that are dropping out of right. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, so if we could only see the young star by itself, it, it would be kind of a diagonal line that runs just across the top of, mm -hmm. of everything that you see here. Um, but this tells us that, you know, there's quite a bit of carbon dioxide there and there's quite a bit of water ice there. There's really a lot of silicates. Silicates are rocks, you know, it's dusty rocks. You go out to the beach, there's, there's lots of silicates on the beach. Um, so the very thing, very common things, um, that we see here on earth, in fact, and, and this is actually why this particular spectrum is so important. Um, Another one of the goals for the Webb telescope is look for conditions that might be conducive to life. Um, you know, what can we find out there? And you'll notice these are very common molecules that we have here on Earth. Um, you know, water is, you know, 70% uh, of the surface of the Earth is, is water. So finding a young star that's still forming, you know, stars form in these clouds of gas and dust. So seeing that those clouds have sort of all the building blocks for life tells us that, you know, the conditions are right. And, you know, I have to make a lame joke. You know, we even see methane gas, you know, around this newborn star. So, yes, that means there are cows in space. Cows in space. There uh, must be. That's, that's <laughs> must be. Um, not that's really. Amazing. That's a perfectly sound conclusion. I think we should publish a paper and submit it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, not really. So okay. with with Webb, we won't be able to say, yes, we have found life 
on some planet. But what we can say, and what we hope to say with great confidence, is that the building blocks necessary to support life are very common. And so it will be up to other instruments, later telescopes, to be able to actually find life. But this at least tells us that the building blocks are common and you know, we might expect to find it someday. Um, that's, that's amazingly exciting. Now, in terms of um, James Webb's um, uh, time horizon, as it were, there, you're looking way, way back. And what you're trying to do, as I understand it, if I understand it correctly, is figure out when the first of the stars and galaxies begin to light up. Um, and that might have happened a lot earlier in the universe. Um, you're looking so far back, things are so faint. I mean, what's the design of, 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 of the telescope that allows you to do that? There must be something about its configuration um, and maybe you'll talk about your instrument on it to let us get a better understanding of how this machine is gonna do to the light, collect the light, analyze the light exactly as we've discussed just now. What's right. the engineering aspect? Like? <clears throat> so the first thing is just the size, um, yeah. it's big. Um, so the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, the primary mirror, the, the mirror that collects the light and focuses it, <clears throat> excuse me, is about 2.4 meters in diameter, rough, roughly eight feet in diameter. Mm -hmm. um, Webb, <clears throat> the, the primary mirror is about six and a half meters in diameter, rough, roughly 20 feet. Um, that's so big, in fact, that we can't build a single mirror um, and put it in a rocket and launch it. Um, mm. So the, the light collecting mirror in Webb is actually 18 hexagonal segments mm. that work together like they were one big mirror. Um, and so, you know, it's a lot of light collecting area. It's the largest space telescope um, that, that we've ever launched. Um, eventually, you know, there are bigger telescopes on the ground, but we need to be able to get above the Earth's atmosphere in order to see um, many of the things in the infrared. Because remember all those molecules that we just talked about finding in space, they're the same molecules that are in our atmosphere absorbing okay. light. So if we wanna see carbon dioxide out in space, we have to get above Earth's atmosphere so that you know our own carbon dioxide doesn't absorb our signal. Uh -huh. um, so it has to be big and it has to be above the Earth's atmosphere. And so that's that's why um, that's why Webb is so sensitive. It's that combination um, that will make it so powerful to help us find stuff. Yeah. Now, let me ask you a question before you move on. You said that those 18 segments work together as one mirror. So you got this large aperture. OK, are they static or do these things have to move? I mean, do they adjust themselves or are they are you, are you just gluing together on a substrate and then they stick there permanently or what's that all about? Yeah, so each segment actually has a number of actuators that tip and tilt each segment, as we call them. So we tip and tilt each segment until they're in very precise alignment. And so we have to do that with all 18 segments mm. in order to form a very sharp image. In fact, when we first launch, we expect each of the segments to be a little bit off so that the very first images that are taken will actually have 18 copies of a star rather than a single, rather than a single image. So there's, there's a certain amount of time where the engineers will just be tipping and tilting those mirrors until everything lines up. Yeah, fascinating. Boy, that's a complex machine. It is. <laughs> and... Uh... My gosh, is all the interesting thing about the James Webb is it doesn't look anything like a telescope. I mean, <laughs> understand what telescopes do, I suppose it does, because they're light gathers, they're light buckets, and then you analyze the light once they're you've acquired it. But um, it, it's sort of a counterintuitive looking thing because you're used to a telescope having a confined barrel. If it's a reflector or a refractor, it doesn't matter. And this thing just really breaks the mold on all of that. Just, yeah. Well, again, that's a function of it being so large and trying to fit it into a rocket. Um, so, you know, the, the mirror, you know, I have a, have a picture later on, but, you know, the, the mirror has to fold up a bit. Um, the uh, structure that's sticking off to the right side is the secondary mirror that reflects light back into the telescope. That has to unfold that big sunshade, which is roughly the size of a telescope tennis court. Um, uh -huh. That silver structure has to unfold as well. Um, so 
because we work at infrared wavelengths, we have to keep the telescope cold. Um, and since we don't have a barrel to protect us, the job of the sunshade is to block sunlight and frankly, light from the earth as well. Um, so that, you know, it's, it's hot on the bottom side of the, of the drawing here, but that the telescope itself actually cools down close to, relatively close to absolute zero. We, we want the telescope to be at a temperature of, you know, roughly 40 to 50 degrees above absolute zero. Um, and so that sunshade um, protects us from the sun, reflects the sun's heat away so that it doesn't warm up our telescope. So why is it that you have to, why do you have to cool things down? I mean, what is it about the infrared signatures that mandate that you have a cool background? Why do you do that? So um, everything with a given temperature radiates heat according to that temperature. Right. And as it turns out, things that are at room temperature, Earth's temperature, um, are at a temperature of 300 degrees above absolute zero. So we call that 300 degrees Kelvin. Um, Things that are at 300 degrees Kelvin radiate most strongly at 10 microns, which is exactly where my instrument works. Okay. Um, so I have a figure that shows uh, the wavelengths of the four instruments on, on James Webb Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. So um, there are three instruments that work at near-infrared wavelengths. There's our workhorse camera near cam, near-infrared camera. Um, our big workhorse spectrometer is near spec, uh, near infrared spectrometer. Okay. Uh, there's a third instrument nicknamed NEARIS, near infrared imaging, imager and slitless spectrometer um, okay. that, that does some specialty uh, imaging and spectroscopy. So it's a, it complements what near cam and near spec can do. Okay. And then there's MIRI, the mid infrared instrument, which is the one that I've been working on. Um, so we're actually sensitive at much longer infrared wavelengths. But as I mentioned, things at room temperature are emitting light exactly where our instrument works. And so if we don't keep the instrument cold, if we don't keep the telescope cold, um, we'll be blinded by emission from the telescope itself. Ah, got it, got it, got it. So you really need to create, a, not, well, an artificially cold background for your imagery to stick. Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic, yeah. Okay. okay. And I noticed there that you have both camera, so that would be maybe optical imaging as well as um, spectroscopy. So you're both looking at things that are, um, I guess both recognizable, maybe not, no, not to the human eye. That's all in, uh, that's all. Yeah, in, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, near, near cam can take images at the very red end of the visible spectrum. Yeah. Right. But it's it's mostly infrared, all all infrared wavelengths. Yeah. So, you know, we'll be able to take images and yes, Webb will take some spectacular pretty pictures. Um, but, you know, we also do a lot of spectroscopy since yeah. since we learn so much from from doing spectroscopy. This is stunning. What, what is what is Mary? You know, congratulations on having such a prominent role in this in this spacecraft. It looks like you've got you know, you're the only one from five microns up. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, so, but let me brag about Mary a little bit. Um, yeah, so Mary's a mid-infrared instrument. Um, because we're the only instrument that works at mid-infrared wavelengths, our instrument includes both a camera and a spectrometer um, so that, you know, we can do that full range of science. Um, you know, this, this is a picture of our instrument. Um, you know, it, it looks a little bit odd, but um, sort of the top layer of that kind of goldish metal color stuff is, is the spectrometer and the camera is just above the, the table surface there. Um, the, one of the fun things about MIRI for me was the fact that it actually was developed as a 50-50 partnership. Okay. Um, so JPL was selected to do the, the, fifth, you know, the half for NASA and a consortium of 24 European astronomical institutes um, did the work for the European Space Agency. And so, you know, everybody had their part. And so working together, we built what we think is a very fantastic instrument. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. yeah. So Do you have a backup that I can have for the California Science Center collection? I'd like to. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, no. <laughs> All right. So let's well tell us more. This is really fantastic. Um, I, I, 
it, it's a fantastic instrument. It, it's going to do a great job. And um, um, but it's a complex machine. You, you, you've got to kind of put it together a little bit while it's on orbit, don't you? It's not all. Yeah. So well, let's let's get back to JWST as a whole. So. Um, <laughs> So this is this is a picture of the telescope. Um, so it, this this is a fairly old picture. It doesn't have the spacecraft underneath it yet, um, but it gives you an idea of you know the size of the telescope, how it unfolds. Um, this is what it looks like when it's all folded up. Um, so you know the space the actual spacecraft that controls the telescope is on the bottom. Um, the kind of pinkish color foil that you see is that big sunshade that we talked about. Yeah. Um, there are two, two sets of panels with three primary mirror segments that fold up behind the telescope. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the configuration that it needs to be in in order to fit into the fairing of the rocket. So, you know, sometimes we call the web telescope the origami telescope because of how it folds up. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But in order to get it into a rocket to launch it in the first place, it, it really does have to fold up. And uh, this is part of why it's taken so long and why it's so expensive is that it has to be able to do all this and then it, you know we have to be able to fold it up and then we have to be able to unfold it after the launch mm -hmm. um, and what kind of rocket are you flying and where are you flying uh, yeah so this is this is a european arian 5 rocket okay. um, we will be the 112th time an arian 5 has been launched and so uh we hope for a very good ride and you're not flying out of Florida, are you? You're not going from the no, US. Uh, this this flies out of Peru and French Guiana down in South America. Uh, it's, where the, where the, yeah. it's where the European Space Agency has their primary launch facility. This is truly an international Earth to the stars mission. I mean, it really is. Yeah. So, yeah, the Webb Telescope itself is a partnership between NASA, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. Um, you know, so working together, um, we, we managed to put put this fantastic machine together. Yeah. Do you know off the top of your head, Mike, how many agencies were involved in this thing? Um, oh, roughly I, how many people have, have touched it? Just just if you happen to know. It's I, I think it's been I think it's more than 10,000 people have worked on it at some point. I don't know how many different agencies. Um, there actually are maps available from the NASA website or maybe the Space Telescope Sciences Institute. Institute website that plots facilities on a world map to so you can see just how spread out the development of this observatory was. Wow, wow. We, know we, all, we have only 15 minutes remaining. I can't believe how fast this is going. <laughs> asking, I keep interrupting you with questions, but why don't you go ahead and, and, and um, show us a little bit about what this origami miracle is going to look like, and um, then we can get to some questions that we've got. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so this is the sequence of the telescope unfolding after launch. Um, maybe I can do a quick little laser pointer thing here with my mouse. So after launch, here's the folded up space telescope. A um, couple of days after launch, it begins to unfold. The, the uh, sun shield uh, begins to extend and then uh, gets tension so that it forms a full, full sun shield. Um, and then uh, 12 days after launch is when the telescope itself begins to unfold. Mm -hmm. And by day 14, then the full telescope um, will look like its final shape. There's still a few more things to go after that. Um, so it's, it's three weeks before the telescope is fully deployed. And then, you know, it's a little bit more time until we actually get out to our orbit um where where we're going to do our observations from um, okay so actually let me let me show you quickly about the orbit so we're not orbiting the earth like the hubble telescope is uh, we're actually going to be at a distance four times the distance of the moon so we're we're at a gravitationally special spot called the second lagrange point which is about a million miles from earth one and a half million kilometers uh, it's where the gravity of the Earth and the Sun kind of balance the motion of the spacecraft. So, you know, the Earth and Sun are pulling in, the spacecraft 
craft is trying to go out. And so they balance each other. So it doesn't take quite as much energy to keep the spacecraft where we want it. Um, but it's, it's a good spot for us because it's farther away from the Earth. So there's not as much, quite as much heat radiating onto the telescope. So that'll let us cool things down and, and get to work. Yeah, well, with no space shuttles flying anymore, plus you're out a million miles, how are we going to fix this thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not, yeah, unless, okay. unless, there unless, they're new, uh, unless there's some new rockets developed. Okay. Um, but in principle, it actually is serviceable. Um, mm -hmm. But we just don't have any way to get there right now. So everything has to work. Yeah, it's got to work right. Yeah, yeah. it's got to work right. So, um, yeah, when's this thing going to fly? Um, right now, our no earlier than launch date is December 24th, so I hope to have a very special Christmas present. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, this, this is what an Ariane 5 looks like when it's launching. It's really spectacular. Yeah. Uh, so right now, we're seven days, 16 hours, 33 minutes, and 25 seconds from launch. So who's yeah. counting? <laughs> Well, I hope I hope Santa brings you everything you want. <laughs> I hope so. There are a lot of people who hope so, not just me. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Thank you for your time, Mike. Listen, we've got a few questions. Um, I want to start with a question from uh, Sung Yu. Um, the question is, how long is the James Webb Space Telescope going to perform its mission? So James Webb was uh, required to have a five-year lifetime, which means that Everything we did uh, to design it and everything to test it um, is to show that it would, it would be able to perform at least five years. Um, now, we think it's going to go a lot longer than that. And in fact, there's propellant for more than 10 years so that once we're in orbit, there should be enough propellant to keep us going for more than 10 years. Um, depending on how the observations go in terms of you know, how we sequence our observations, we might be able to go even more than 15. So um, the, the official answer is at least five years. Um, we obviously hope to go quite a bit longer than that. Let me follow up with a question of my own, and that is some people seem to think that the JWST, James Webb, is a real replacement for Hubble. It's a successor to Hubble, but does it really replace it? No, it does not replace it at all. And in fact, we hope Hubble keeps going a few more years. We'd like to use them both at the same time. Um, Hubble is primarily visible wavelength light with some ultraviolet capabilities and a little bit of near infrared capability. Web is really infrared. Um, so, you know, Hubble allows us to ask a lot of questions. Web will hopefully allow us to answer some of the questions that, that Hubble allowed us to ask. Um, but the pair of them together would be a really powerful uh, scientific capability. So fingers crossed that Hubble hangs on for a few more years because we really would like to use them together. And the thing too, just to make sure that, that, that we and all the audience understand, okay, the reason that, that, that Web is an infrared instrument is because the things are themselves emitting in that wavelength. It's because their motion has shifted them such that that's where you find them. It's not that- Well, it's, it's, it's actually both. Um, so when, when we wanna look at uh, the first light emitting objects in the universe or you know, how the first galaxies formed, that's visible light that's been redshifted into the infrared. And so that, that was part of your statement. But we also wanna look at um, how stars form. So stars in our own galaxy, how did they form? So that light isn't redshifted. That's just in the infrared. Um, okay. So, so, you know, we want to do everything. Actually, in fact, we can even look at Mars. <laughs> sort of, <laughs> yeah. sort of. Uh, Mars, Mars is going to be so bright. Um, I don't think Miri can look at Mars at all, but we can, might be able to look at the moons around Mars. Uh, we we'll are certainly be looking at Jupiter and some of the other planets. So, right. you know, Webb is really a general purpose observatory. So everything from our solar system all the way out to a couple hundred million years after the Big Bang. Okay, so it's not just a time machine. It is also a machine that looks at things that are thermally in a spectrum, even if they're just next door. Correct. Uh, yep. So I uh, got time for a question from Antonio. This one is... Um, how long is it expected to take before the telescope is actually operational? 
that means to me, when do you get first light? Yeah, so um, there's a sequence of events that we need to go through in order to fully commission the telescope. So we expect to start doing the first science observation six months after launch, which I know is a really long time. Everybody's going to say, where is, you know, is it working? Um, so it, it takes us six months to do everything that we need to do to say the observatory is fully working and it's ready to start doing all the great science observations that we want to do. Um, part, of, part of what we need to do along the way, so using the example of my own instrument, MIRI, um, we actually have to cool our camera down to six degrees above absolute zero. And that takes about three months. Mm. So three months after launch, we're just waiting for our instrument to get cold enough that we can turn it on and start doing anything at all. And I do have the privilege of taking the very first image with Miri. Unfortunately, it's going to be of the back of a metal plate because <laughs> we need to protect our protect our optics and our detectors from potential contamination. So we have a contamination control cover. And so the very first image is gonna be the back of a metal plate. Other people will get to take the first images of things in the sky, but oh, yeah. that's that's part of being able to say, yes, Miri is ready to, to start working. Um, important calibration point. You gotta make sure you know what you're looking at. Absolutely. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, that's an example of just how much thought must I, I can't imagine literally the millions of things like that, that your team and the 10,000 people that you're working with must have had to think, of. You, you know, yep. as you go along the way, you say, oh my God, I got to do this. And then another problem comes up, oh, never thought of that. I got to solve it this way. It's just, it's incredible. Yeah. It's just yeah. incredible. So we'll take a final question from Anupam. Uh, this is a great question too. It says, will the James Webb Space Telescope be able to detect supermassive and ultra-massive black holes? And if yes, how's it going to do it? Yeah, so um, yes, it will, kind of. Um, we, can't, we can't detect the black holes directly um, okay. because black holes themselves don't emit light. Well, that's why they're black. But we can look for the effects of the supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. So like in our own galaxy, um, you know, you may have heard about Andrea Goetz, who's a professor at UCLA who won the Nobel Prize, I think, two years ago. Um, her prize was for determining that there is a very massive black hole in the center of our galaxy. And she and others, uh, Reinhard Genzel in Germany, won half the prize for that as well. Um, they, they did it by looking at how fast stars were moving around the center of our galaxy and concluded that the only way they could move the way they did was if there was a million mass, million solar mass black hole. So a black hole that, that's a million times the mass of a typical star was in the center. And so when Webb looks at distant galaxies looking for these, you know, ultra massive black holes, what we can do is remember those Doppler shifts. So as stars move around the black hole, stars on one side of that black hole will be moving toward us. Stars on the other side will be moving away from us. Right. And so the spectral lines coming from the galaxy near the center will be red shifted or blue shifted with respect to the rest of the galaxy. And we'll be able to say these stars on this side of the center are moving really fast toward us and stars on the other side are moving really fast away from us. Yeah. And by how fast they're moving allows us to measure the, how big an object has to be in the center. And so, you know, if there's something that's many millions of times more massive than, than the sun or even billions of times, we'll be able to see it by how the velocities of the stars behave. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I guarantee you people are trying to do exactly that. Um, so that will definitely be one of the science topics. That sounds like, well, first of all, you, you mentioned uh, Professor Gez. I, I do know her. In fact, she was very gracious. She served as an advisor to the California Science Center's um, Samuel Ocean Air and Space Center project that we're building. So we're very grateful for her time on that. The technique that, she, that, that she's going to use for this or that you guys are going to use it sounds very much like what uh, Dr. Vera Rubin did when she was looking at galaxy rotation rates. Right. It came up with a different subject, but it came up with this, this conclusion, oh my God, there must be dark matter, uh, something that we don't see that's at work in the universe, because by rights, according to Newton, these things ought to fly apart. Right. So it sounds like it's exactly that technique. It's amazing. 
it, it, it actually is. So, um, you know, I didn't use those terms, you know, velocity profile, um, but yeah, as, as we study how stars within a galaxy move, mm -hmm. um, that's how we found that there was dark matter, matter that we couldn't see, but we knew it had to be there because of the gravitational effects on the velocity of stars and galaxies. So we said, hey, there's, there's something there that we can't see, but it's definitely affecting the rotation curve, you know, how fast the stars are rotating around the galaxy. And supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies are just the extreme part of that, you know, the parts closest in yeah. where we see, you know, things that are moving much faster than they ought to be moving. Um, yeah, so it's it's all rotate, you know, it's it's all related, and that rotation helps us understand how galaxies are put together, um, how they were formed, how they how they grow old. Um, so it's it's all it's all part of the technique that we use to understand something about galaxies. So it's good stuff. It's fascinating how these bits and pieces of the puzzle are laid down at certain points in time. They all come together. At certain projects and now you're using these techniques you've got this fabulous fabulous instrument that that's going to launch uh our christmas present so um going forward what's the future yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> um what, you know what what's what do you see for the future what's the future what's um tell me where we're going and what this thing's going to do yeah so um again the the most important thing that we're going to learn from web is the stuff we don't know anything about um you know, we, we actually do have an entire year of science observations planned out. Uh, astronomers from all over the world were able to submit proposals for things to observe. And so we have that first year ready to go. Um, but the most exciting are the ones that discover something that we never knew before. You know, it's, you know every time we think we understand something about the universe, it surprises us. Um, there's, there's something that jumps up that, you know, we just didn't expect. And that's, that's the most important stuff. It's also the most fun stuff. Um, you know, like when I found those goofy rings around the planetary nebula, it was like, wow, this is so cool. Where'd they come from? Um, and so, you know, that's, that's what, that's what makes doing science like this so much fun. It's just stuff we didn't know about. Um, and there's always something. So I can't wait to see what Webb's going to find. It, it will be something I can't predict. Um, it's like the universe is playing a game with us, isn't it? It's like hide yeah. Like yeah, when it's not trying to kill us, it's trying to amuse us. So um. <laughs> when it's not, not, not throwing uh, uh, things like, like giant meteors at us or something like that. Absolutely. Right, <laughs> exactly. So um, just, is this the biggest telescope we've ever flown? It's the biggest one we've yeah. ever flown, right? Yeah. Yeah. At, at, certainly at these wavelengths. Um, so that's, <laughs> and, and, you know, so that's, that's why it's, that's why it's so exciting. It's, you know, it's, it's so much bigger, so much more sensitive. Um, yeah. And it, it really will allow us to find stuff that we just had no idea was there. Fantastic. So. Well, I really, really thank you for your time, Mike. Um, I want to give you a chance to plug the next project that you're working on. Well, we're going to <laughs> Just so everybody knows that once this launches, not only you're going to be monitoring it and helping its operation, but you've got other things on your plate that JPL has assigned you. So give you a second just to plug that and then we'll wrap up. So since you mentioned the universe throwing asteroids at us, um, another thing that NASA is interested in is looking for the so-called near-Earth asteroids, asteroids that actually do come close to the Earth and could potentially hit the Earth someday. Um, so uh, Dr. Amy Meinzer at the University of Arizona is uh, leading a, um, a new telescope to survey the skies to look specifically for asteroids that might be heading our direction. Um, so that's, we're, we're in the early design phases um, and uh, it's still a few years out, but maybe by 2026, we'll have that launched as well. And, we'll start looking for those very fast moving and very close by asteroids, trying to find them before they find us. And right there in that IR temperature range, right there. Exactly. And in fact, we observe at the same wavelengths <clears throat> that Miri observes trying to find these things. Um, <clears throat> Mike, I cannot thank you enough. This has been, this, this hour has flown by. 
it has been a great pleasure for me to, to have a chance to talk with you. And I wish you all the very best. And um, yeah, we'll look for a successful James Webb telescope launch. Thanks very much for having me. It is absolutely my pleasure. Be well, take care.